In this lecture, we finish our unit on tricksters by looking at two very famous African ones, Eshu and Legba, who in a way summarize a lot of what we've been saying about the trickster over the last four lectures. Last time we looked at African tricksters who are associated with animals or who at least can switch back and forth. This time we'll take a look at two who consistently appear in some kind of human form. Both are really gods themselves, or at least related to gods, which gives them a kind of enhanced status. They're perhaps related more closely to tricksters like Hermes or Enki or Loki than to Tortoise and Anansi, whom we looked at last time. Both Eshu and Legba are, in fact, mediators between heaven and earth, a function that they share with other tricksters in other places. Eshu is a trickster of the Yoruba people in southwest Nigeria. He has many of the characteristics we associate with tricksters everywhere. In one myth, he talks the sun and moon into changing places and reverses the normal order of things. In all of his stories, he's one of those tricksters who loves stirring up trouble among humans. One of the famous stories that gets told over and over is there are two farmers who have worked together. They're good friends. They've worked side by side together for so many years. They've actually started to dress alike. And like a husband and wife who've been married forever, they actually are starting to look alike. One day they're working in fields across the road from one another, and Eshu comes down the road between them, wearing a hat that is white on one side, and it's either red or black on the other side. To make things even more confusing, he has a pipe sticking out the back of his head, and he wears a club over his back, so that if you're working and you just glance up, um, it would be impossible to tell even which direction he was walking in. Later on in the day, after they, have, after they finish their work, the two farmers chat about this stranger, wondering who he was who walked down the road, and they find out that they disagree about just everything, they, about what color his hat was, about which direction he was going, um, and they quarrel for the first time in years, and in fact the quarrel becomes so heated that eventually they get hauled before the chief who's supposed to arbitrate. The chief, of course, can't make head or tail out of this. How does he know what they're talking about? Eshu himself shows up, explaining that neither man is lying, but that both are fools. He explains the trick. The chief sends the officers after Eshu, who runs away, and on his way out of town, he lights several houses on fire. When people bring out their most valuable possessions, Eshu promises to take care of them, says, don't worry, you go, you go you know, find some way to put out the fire, and I'll guard your possessions. And then he gives them away randomly to anybody who walks by. These turn out to be that kind of unexpected gift for those random passers-by. That's one of the things we said tricksters do is they're responsible for unexpected windfalls. And the possessions of these people are then scattered to the four winds. We remember um, that Hermes, too, was a, was a patron of merchants, but he's also the patron of thieves and the patron of all transactions. And here, all sorts of transactions happen. These are happy accidents for some, those people who wound up getting something for nothing. They're unhappy accidents for others. When standing before the, the chief, Eshu says, and this is probably one of his slogans, I made them quarrel. Sowing discord is my greatest delight. So he is a real trickster. But he's also, as almost all tricksters are, a culture hero responsible for one of the greatest gifts of the Yoruba, the art of divination, of being able to read the will of the gods for us so that we know what the gods have in mind for us so we can direct our courses accordingly. In the myth that explains where divination comes from, the gods have already moved away to the sky and they're in trouble. They are very slowly starving to death because people have stopped giving them sacrifices. They've tried everything to, to get people to start sacrificing again. They've sent plagues, they've sent famine, they've spent, sent storms. They've even struck people with lightning, trying to scare them back into doing sacrifices, and nothing works. The gods, as a last resort, actually try to do some hunting and fishing themselves, but with comic results, it, they're just not good at that sort of thing. Eventually, they come to Eshu, and they say, what can we do to get people to start sacrificing again? He starts by consulting a river goddess, and she says, you have to give people something that's so good that they'll want to keep it forever and in gratitude and to make sure they keep it forever they will continue to sacrifice. The next question is what should that something be and it's the river goddess's husband says divination, divination, the art of being able to see what the gods have in store for you and he says do it with palm nuts. 
Um, but, he says to Eshoo, you're going to have to learn the meaning of the palm nuts first. He gets 16 palm nuts from uh, monkeys, but he still has no idea what to do with them. So he does a kind of divine survey, asking the 16 major gods, or orishas as they're called, for readings of what any one combination of nuts might mean. The gods and goddesses realize that this is going to be a, a useful and valuable thing for them, and so they cooperate, they help. Um, and which means that in some ways what they are doing is they're going to be imparting some of their divine knowledge to humans via this divination process. It isn't a simple process. There is, there are, each of the 16 Orishas gives Eshu 16 sayings for each combination, making for a total, total of 256 possible outcomes. On top of this, each of those 256 possible outcomes needs to be interpreted by way of proverbs and sayings and stories so that the number of possible responses is virtually limitless. Still, this is the way, the only way that humans can learn the will of the gods. And even with all the possible ambiguities, it's the closest thing I have to knowing what the gods have in mind for me. If I have a question, shall I continue this love affair or end it? Shall I take this trip or stay home? Am I better off sticking with my old job or striking out in a new direction? This is my chance to find out what the gods have decreed for me, and I need to check out as best I can before deciding. Well, Eshu's plan works. Um, the story, one of the versions of this story ends this way. In this way, the gods now impart their knowledge to their descendants on earth. Humankind can know the will of the gods and what will come to pass in the future. When human beings understood that through Eshu they could escape evil things in the days to come, they began to slaughter animals again and burn them for the gods. In this way, Eshu brought the palm nuts down to humankind, and humankind satisfied the hunger of the 16 gods. It's a quid pro quo. Uh, the gods have to give up some of their divine secrets, but they get to eat. Humans have to sacrifice, but they can learn the will of the gods for their lives. The, the god or Orisha, whose will is most manifest in this divination process, is, is named Ifa. We can think of him, if we want, it's not quite accurate, but we can think of him as a god of fate or destiny with which we're born. When the palm nuts sp fall on a special wooden plate that's made just for this ritual, we get a glimpse of Ifa's will. The palm nuts are thrown and then they are read by a diviner who has to be trained in this art, just as a psychiatrist has to be trained in our own arts of divination. The diviner will look at the combination, and then he will start to recite the proverbs and sayings and stories that go with that combination. This isn't an exact science any more than psychiatry is, but what has to happen is the questioner asks, has to pay attention to all of these stories, all of these proverbs, all of these sayings, and sooner or later, he will hear one that resonates with him or her, says, that's the one, that's the one, that's the one that applies here, and he will know what the will of the gods is in this case. Um, William Bascom, in uh, a book called Aoife Divination, Communication Between Gods and Men in West Africa, tells a story to show how this divination works. The story is reported by Lewis Hyde, who imagines a man going to a diviner to ask if he should make a trip. So I, I'm now this person, and I'm saying to the diviner, cast the palm nuts for me, please, and let me know whether I should take this trip or not. Um, and the diviner will cast the nuts, and then he will start telling me stories and proverbs and things that have to do with that particular combination. And this is a story he tells me. He tells me that once, a long time ago, a, a diviner cast for a man named Ajiolili, when he was planning to travel to a distant town. The palm nuts told him that he to assure a safe trip, he should sacrifice a nanny goat, three cocks, a hen, and a razor blade. Since Eshu was always in this process, he always takes part of the sacrifice for himself. In this case, he takes the razor blade. So that when Ajiolili gets to the distant town, Eshu takes the razor blade and slips it back into Ajiolili's hand. The chief's daughter, uh, named Oran, is selling goods at a, at, at a market, and when Ajiolili moves in to buy some of her goods, um, Eshu pushes her against his razor blade and she cuts herself. 
a fight breaks out and everybody accuses this stranger of being a troublemaker, but Eshoo intervenes to say it wasn't his fault, he didn't do anything on purpose, he didn't start the fight. And he said, I think the, the best solution to this would be that he should move in to Oran's house, or Oran should move in with him, they should be together, and he will have to care for her until this cut is healed. Everyone finally agrees that's the thing to do. Oran is already married, but she has no children. When she and Ajio Lili begin living together, they also start sleeping together, and after a couple of months, she's visibly pregnant. When the chief is informed of this, he is so delighted that he gives Oran to Ajio Lili as his wife. The second and third chiefs, not to be outdone, throw in their daughters as well, so that by the time Ajio Lili comes back to his own village, he has three wives and an entire entourage. If we go back now to that question, me, the one who came to ask the question, should I take this trip, if that's the way the, the palm nuts came down and that's the story that applies, and I'm listening, I will say, yes, I definitely should take this trip. Yes, yes, yes. Ajio Lili left home without a wife. He came home with three, and in their culture, he didn't have to pay a bride price for any of them. Is that a successful journey or what? So if I'm the questioner and this is the story prompted by the palm nuts, I'll take the journey since I see that the gods have good things in store for me. There's more to be said about this divination and we'll come back to it in a, in a moment, but now I want to tell you a couple of stories about the other trickster um, in our lecture today, Legba. Legba is a kind of cousin of Eshu. The Fawn of Benin were very much influenced by the Yoruba, so they may be, in fact be the same character, just deflected away from each other a little bit by different cultures. They share a lot of stories anyway, including this very first one. In this story, Legba is the son of the great goddess Mau. The great god in this story was actually androgynous, but Mau is her female side. He's a good son. He does what his mother tells him to do. She still lives uh, on the earth at this time. But so she, every day she tells him what to do and he goes and does it. He's, he's a good son. But he notices after a while that any time good things happen to people, she gets the credit. Every time bad things happen, he gets the blame. And so he goes to complain to his mother, says this isn't a fair arrangement, you know, the way this all works out. And she says, that's just the way things have to be. It is useful for a master to, to have a good reputation while the servant can be known as evil and take all the blame. So Legba says, this isn't going to go on for much longer. I will get even. So what he does is his mother has a great yam garden and he tells her that someone he has overheard is planning on stealing all of her yams. And she makes a, calls a great council and says, anybody stealing my lambs, yams will be immediately put to death. One night then Legba steals his mother's sandals, puts them on, and then steals all of her yams while wearing her sandals. In the morning, Mau calls everybody together to find out who stole her yams. And no foot matches the footprints in the garden because they're very much larger than anybody else's. Legba says, did you maybe harvest them yourself and then forget that you did it? And she's incensed and she says, absolutely not, but she goes and tries her footprint, which of course fits exactly. Everybody laughs, Mau is embarrassed, and she decides she can't, she doesn't want to live that close to earth anymore. Her first stage of moving, however, is only to move about 10 feet away, so the sky now, I have to imagine, is just about 10 feet above the earth. She still gives Legba instructions every day about what to do on earth, and he still has to carry them out. But in a story that we've run across before in other places, Legba gets an old woman every night to throw her dirty dishwater up into the sky. Each night, he, she manages to soak Mau, and eventually Mau gets tired of this and moves far away into the sky, leaving Legba on the earth below. Like Eshu, Legba now becomes a mediator between them. He also, in parallel ways, becomes the god of divination for the Fawn, by which heaven and earth can talk to each other. There's another Legba story which confirms what we know about tricksters everywhere. The high goddess in this story has seven sons. The first six are each given dominion over some specific part of the cosmos, the earth, the sky, the seas, animals, the hunt, iron. The seventh one, but the trouble is, oh, those six sons each speak a different language appropriate to his domain, so they can't communicate with each other or with the mother. The seventh son is Legba, and he is the one who's able to translate among the spheres. If any brother wants to talk to another brother or to the mother, or the mother wants to talk to one of her sons, they all have to go through Legba. Just as among the Yoruba, you need to go through Eshu to talk to the gods. 
This is really a typical situation for the trickster. Again, always living on the edges of things, between here and there, this and that. And again, like other tricksters, he mediates those borders. Here he mediates borders even within his own family. And again, as we've seen so often, language turns out to be one of the trickster's specialties. Like all tricksters, both Eshu and Legba are wanderers. They live in the spaces between things and between categories. Their special places, as is true for so many other tricksters, are crossroads and thresholds and boundaries between inside and outside. Like the Herms in Greek cities, there were icons of Eshu in village doorways and at the gates leading in and out of the village, icons that one always touched for good luck when one passed. And they also live, of course, on moral and social and religious edges, too. Laura Macarius, in an essay that we looked at a couple of lectures ago, reminds us that both Eshu and Legba are really serious taboo breakers, um, especially prone to sexual misconduct. And both are thus marked with the kinds of impurity that comes from moving back and forth between the rule-bound life of the village and the relatively lawless life of nature, or, as we've been calling him, the dung heaps outside the fences. Eshu, in one story, is responsible for slipping enough palm wine to the creator while he's creating human beings that he flubs, making, making cripples and albinos and all manner of other misshapen creatures. And his practice of causing a stroke of either good or bad luck has a way of unsettling life in stable communities. It, as we know, all communities are arranged in such a way that the social hierarchy tends to stay intact and rich people tend to see rich and poor people tend to stay poor. Even potlatches have their rules so that over time the wealthiest tend to stay wealthy and the poor tend to stay poor. So what happens? in any stable society when Eshu, running away from the chief's men, sets houses on fire, promises to take care of the goods, and then randomly distributes them. What kind of instability can a trickster introduce into a community just by behaving that way? I've mentioned quite a few times in our unit on tricksters a book by Lewis Hyde called Trickster Makes This World. Um, one of his theses in, in, that runs through that entire book is that tricksters are absolutely essential for keeping a culture vital and healthy and growing. As he argues, any culture or institution left to its own for too long, allowed to make its own rules, and then to enforce them without disturbance will ossify or grow so rigid that uh, it can't bend anymore, it has no flexibility. It will reach such a state of internal perfection that it can only die. Tricksters are those people, and we've said this before, who bring some kind of dirt into those kinds of cultures, causing distress and disorder at first. They always begin by disturbing things. But once that dirt gets incorporated into a culture or institution, then the entity has to re redefine itself in terms of the dirt in ways that will keep it alive and functioning and vital. It's why tricksters are all culture heroes. Um, by messing things up, by disturbing the stasis, they become agents of creation in the same way that were all those creator gods that we looked at in Unit 1. They disturb entropy and stasis, they stir it up, and the universe or culture responds by defining itself, by becoming something, by moving on, and thus in really important ways, tricksters are also always creators, shaping the world that we live in. Another way of saying this is that tricksters always introduce accidents or chance into places that try to rule them out, that tries to make accident or chance impossible. That's why it's so perfect that Eshu should have been, should be the agent of Aoife's oracle in the divination process. Aoife's voice is the voice of fate, of what will be, of what the gods have willed. Eshu is the voice of that oracle and his face is the one on the wooden plate on which the palm nuts are thrown in the divination ceremony. But he's a trickster who loves causing discord and messing around with people as he does with his trick hat in the story that we started with. He's frequently not a very reliable messenger for Aoife. Sometimes he gets the message wrong. Sometimes he changes it just for fun. And sometimes he makes it ambiguous enough that it's hard to make any sense of it. Who knows exactly what Aoife had meant to happen to Ajio Lili? What we do know is that Eshu steps into the story, appropriates part of the sacrifice for himself, and then causes everything to happen that happens in the rest of the story, giving Ajio Lili one of those windfalls that tricksters are famous for. Here he gets three wives without having to pay a bride price for any of them. 
On the other hand, we have to remember there's a husband in that remote village who loses his wife in a very unexpected way, and that the trickster is at work there too, just as it was for those people whose houses caught fire and lost their goods while random strangers walked away with a lot of valuable new possessions. Agio Lili's story isn't the way things are supposed to work in a well-regulated world, but it is the way things work when a trickster gets, gets into it. Whenever he's there, some people get lucky, find windfalls, others lose their shirts, and there's no telling what will happen to me today when a trickster's on the loose. It's why people touch the icon in the doorway whenever they go in or out, asking for good luck today rather than bad. And that Legba should be the translator among his brothers and his mother suggests that there'll be some accidents here too. Sometimes he won't get the message right, and sometimes he'll change it for the fun of it, and in either case, chance or accident will enter into this family, um, into the family as well as into the community. When the tricksters, whenever a trickster's in the neighborhood, things are going to get shaken up, accidents will happen, and out of the confusion, a new order will emerge. Hyde says that there's a tendency of every component in any kind of system to perfect itself according to its own nature. When it does, it will draw apart from other components and the whole structure loses its vitality. In the myth of Demeter and Persephone that we, and Hades that we looked at back in Lecture 27, it is Hades' nature to seal the gates of the underworld so that no soul can ever escape. But in that myth, we remember, if that means that Persephone can never return, spring will never occur again on earth, and both humans and gods will die, then Hermes the trickster is sent to Hades to change the rule of Hades. That's what tricksters do. Introduces something new into it and makes it change its spots. We can treat the, the, the uh, trickster psychologically as we did the hero back in uh, Unit 3. Um, so that he becomes a psychological hero as well as a cultural hero. Um, Clyde Ford, in his The Hero with an African Face, reads the Eshoo myths in the same way that Carl Jung or Joseph Campbell reads hero myths. For Ford, the trickster is a character who lives inside each one of us, in our own internal doorways and thresholds and boundaries, between our rational and analytic and competitive and practical selves on the one hand, and the selves we are in dreams on the other, between the conscious and the unconscious. In this case, the fences we try to stay inside of are internal ones. We try to stay in our safe zones, the place where we're comfortable, the place where we know what's going on. But internally as well as externally, Trickster is always there on the fence or in the doorway or on the threshold. He's been rummaging around in the garbage again, and he's got some with him that he'd like to bring into our safe, sanitary worlds and mess them up a little bit. When that happens to us individually, we have the same choices that cultures do. We can carry the garbage back outside the walls and put it back where it came from and pretend that none of this happened. Or we can take some of the garbage in and make some compromises the way we do the compromises in the way we do things in order to accommodate his presence. The way the Pantheon and Mount Olympus had to take in Hermes as its twelfth member and had to change the way it did things from that time forward. Whatever we do, he won't go away unless we tie him up under the earth, tie him down with the entrails of his own child, with a poison serpent dripping venom on his face, the way the gods of Asgard treated Loki, and we know that if we do that, we've probably just sealed our own dooms, since we'll all go the same rigid way until he returns at Ragnarok to destroy us all. Lewis Hyde thinks that there are some artists who serve trickster functions for us in our own culture by bringing into our worlds some dirt that we've tried to get rid of and then forcing us to face up to it and to remake our cultures. He discusses in his book such painters and writers as Marcel Duchamp, Pablo Picasso, Allen Ginsberg, Frederick Douglass, and even Robert Maplethorpe as doing trickster work by making us deal with some kind of dirt that we had tried to define away, but which they make us face up to and accommodate. In lecture 16, we talked about the Japanese myth of Amaterasu and Susa Noo, in which Susa Noo is the god of storms, and in which he invades his sister's palace in the sky. 
at the time she's celebrating the, the heavenly uh, harvest ritual and she celebrates it because she lives in the sky she's celebrating it with amazing purity in her sacred hall there are virgins weaving new garments and all is purity and light Susa Noo arrives however and really messes all of this up before he even gets to the palace he's already wreaked havoc in the heavenly rice paddies by turning loose some ponies and letting them muck around in the water when he enters his sister's palace he spreads feces all over even under her throne he rips a hole in the roof and he drops in a dead pony that actually falls on one of the weaving virgins and she is killed by her own spindle the sister his sister Amaterasu um, appalled at all of this bad behavior is so put out by it that she hides in a cave because she is the goddess of the sun when she hides in the cave the light goes out and earth begins to sink into darkness into drought into famine um, we talked about the ending of that story back in lecture 16 we know that she's going to be lured back out of her cave by the mirror and the laughter and the dance and then the straw rope will be put behind her so that she does get lured back out of her cave but for our purposes here we're interested in Susa Noo who is in this story is kind of the the trickster character he's banished from heaven after all his bad behavior which is not too surprising and when he's banished from heaven he comes to live on earth there one of the first things he does is he kills a food goddess and then out of her body comes seeds millet red beans wheat and soybeans so Susa Noo's appalling behavior in heaven winds up making the world a more fertile place for humans and he becomes a culture hero responsible in part for the creation of agriculture the harvest in heaven that he attended the one his sister was holding was only for heaven but Susa Noo the trickster transfers those seeds from heaven to earth and thus helps to feed the human race and he does it by introducing into that pristine palace of the sun with all of its impulses toward purity and closure and order some real real dirt Hyde whose reading of this myth we've been more or less following um, in, in I've been following and telling you this story says this about the story you get no seeds at all if the sunlight is too pure ever to mingle with the muck of the rice paddies you get no seeds if manure never enters the new palace and because there is always a hunger seeking for those seeds whenever humans or gods move to purify life by excluding death or to protect order completely from the dirt that is its byproduct trickster will upset their plans when purity approaches sterility he will tear a hole in the sacred enclosure and drop a dead pony on the virgin weavers or strew his feces under the sun goddess's throne in the legba story we saw that a trickster can create the boundary between heaven and earth threatening the gods with dirt until they retreat into the distant sky the part of the story he's referring to there is that part where when um, his mother had moved only about 10 feet away and he wanted her to go farther away and so he got the old woman to throw dirty dishwater into her face every night until she finally moves away that's what he means when he says here's some more dirt a little more dirt which allowed legba in this case to create the distance between earth and heaven but once there is such a once there is such a here we can see that once such a boundary exists trickster can abrogate it importing dirt into the exalted holes until some of heaven's wealth is loosened and the earth is fertilized the sun reborn that makes the trickster in this myth a true creator disturbing stasis until it yields to differentiation and a place where you and I can live reminding us of some of the very the patterns in our very first unit in this course so the trickster does many things for us he allows us to express deeply repressed parts of ourselves he allows us to find a balance between destructiveness and creativity at both cultural and psychological levels he can serve as a mediator between logical impossible positions allowing us to have our cake and eat it too he can encourage us to make new combinations out of materials the world gives us becoming brick allures or tinkers ourselves he allows us temporary access to a liminal world where we can sink back into nature before returning with new identities and roles to play 
And he's always on the fence, always reminding us not to let any social order become too rigid or sterile or suffocating. So, despite his grievous offenses, despite his foolishness, despite his arrogance and presumption, and despite his occasional stupidity, he's still a culture hero, a creator, and we have a lot to be grateful to him for, as those Zandi parents are when they tell his stories to their children. Next time we'll start a new unit on mythical places, places that themselves become sacred because of something that happened there. We'll start with Bethel stones and lakes in our first lecture. That's next time.